Good morning. I don't know about you guys, but I have been loving this series entitled My Story, How Dying Changed My Life. Anyone else been liking this series? Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. In the first week, this is our third week, the first week we talked about the story of Jesus. And anyone like that story? Huh? And then last week, uh, Nicole McLean shared her story. And if you were here, I'm sure you loved it. If not, grab a copy of that from the bookstore or watch online. Just a powerful story. And it was interesting, though. Do you remember what Nicole said last week? She said, great, I've got to follow Jesus. All right? Because he went the week before. His story, anyway. Uh, and then this week, as I was speaking to the couple who's going to share today, they said, great, we've got to follow Nicole. <laughs> but here's the good news. Because of Jesus' story, all of our stories are powerful, right? All of our stories have deep meaning if our story and Jesus' story really come together. So I would ask you to put your hands together and welcome to the New Hope stage my friends and an awesome part of our spiritual family, Kyle and Ashley Ludwig. Invite them. So uh, after the first service, I thought maybe Rob wouldn't steal our icebreaker again, but he did. We were going to come out and talk about how Nicole did such a great job, but I guess he didn't take a hint. So, <laughs> Anyhow, um, my name's Kyle. This is my wife, Ashley. I've um, got a pretty cool story to share with you. Um, about 11, actually we met about 11 years ago. Um, and we're actually, I'm 27, she's 26, kind of give you an idea where we're at. We're actually in high school, and I remember the first date, um, kind of interesting. Went out, picked her up, we went and got a movie, and came back and went to her mom and dad's house and uh, enjoyed the movie with her two little sisters and little brother. So either there was something really special about Ashley or I really liked her family, I don't know. I think I'm going to go with Ashley, so. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, that's kind of how... We uh, started out, and um, so we dated through high school, and um, we, uh, we fell in love. Um, we knew that we wanted to uh, spend the rest of our lives together, so we decided to get married. Um, there was a lot of people that thought, you know, that's not a good idea. Um, you're young. Make sure you know what you're doing. Um, but, you know, some of the thoughts that we had, and I'll let Ashley share some of that with you. My response to that was always that um, we weren't guaranteed long lives together, so um, if I knew who I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, why would we wait? Um, so we went ahead and uh, we got married. I was out of high school for a year by then, and Ashley had just graduated, so it was two months after she graduated high school. And um, so at that point, you know, we just getting started out, didn't have a lot of money, didn't really know where we were at, you know, financially. Um, so we went on a pretty cheap honeymoon. Um, it was so cheap, you know, you get the free breakfast in the morning at the hotel. <laughs> you, know, you know, the first day we went down there, it was so busy, and um, a lot of the good stuff was gone. So the rest of the week, we set our alarm for like, I think, 6 o'clock in the morning <laughs> to beat the rush and get the good food. So, kind of give you a picture of where we were at at that time. So, um, anyhow, you know, we still had a great time because we were together in love. And uh, we got back home and, you know, life sets in. But, you know, we were, we were still happy. We were just happy to be together. And, um, you know, one of the first big decisions that we had to make together was, um, you know, where were we going to go to church? Uh, we both grew up in church. Both had a good, good relationship with God. And um, but her church, you know, in mine, we were just a little bit different. We believed the same things, but um, so we wanted to find some place that we both both liked. And we ended up down here in Loudonville. And um, Pastor Charles was the pastor that time. And um, so that was about eight years ago. And um, so about two months after we got married, we were sitting in the service over next door, and uh, Pastor Charles was talking about. Um, you know, taking that step and uh, finding what God's will was for you. And, um, you know, without letting my wife know, um, I was sitting there praying and, and told God, uh, use me. Uh, use me however you want to. Um, you 
know, before I I had always said, you God use me, but don't don't do this. You can do that. Like I'm in charge, really. You know. Anyhow, um, that day I was serious and and told God, you know, use me. And um, just I think it was days after that, um, I came home from work and had um, a rash all over my body, and end up at rapid response and shortly after that found out that the lump on my neck uh, wasn't just a pulled muscle and um, the really cool thing is you know we'd already you know seen God work uh, through all that because by the time we got back home that rash was completely gone and um, you know I was 19 I wasn't going to go to the doctor because I had you know not on my neck um, so God you know I'm giving you a rash and you're going to the doctor if that's that's that how we're gonna get there. So um from there, um uh, kinda got crazy. Um you know, they did x rays and blood work and um as the night went on it seemed like, you know, this is a little bit more serious than what we thought. And um so from there, from rapid response the next day we were at the family doctor, uh then we got the CAT scan and then we went on to see uh the surgeon and um by the end of that week, um I was going in for a biopsy. So uh, we were headed in for the biopsy, and uh, by then we knew that there was something pretty wrong. Um, a lot of doctors were kind of thinking that it might be Hodgkin's uh, cancer. Um, so we went in, had the biopsy done, and uh, after, right after the surgery, the uh, surgeon came in and said, you know, it, it does look like Hodgkin's. And um, so we thought, okay. But we still had to wait for the you know, final results because we weren't sure, he said, just by looking at it. So we waited, and um, we had next doctor's appointment with him and had the final results back, and uh, we went in, and. Uh, found out it was actually uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma T-cell, which is actually a pretty rare uh, form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then also, um, you know, it, it was a very aggressive cancer. Um, but he, he told us what it was, and, you know, w we weren't familiar with any cancers, really. Um, and so we had no idea what that meant or anything. And, uh, you know, we were asking him, you know, what, well, what's that mean? You know, is it bad? And... Uh, we kind of got the hint that it was bad when he didn't want to explain it to us and said, I have a doctor, and um, I'm going to send you to him right now, and uh, he can sit down and talk to you about it. And um, at this time, you know, we were young, um, a lot of decisions for doctors, and we didn't have to make one of them. Um, you know, from family doctor, he sent us to the surgeon, and then right then from the surgeon right to uh, Dr. X, which was my doctor then. And... Um, you know, at the time, people were telling us, you know, go to Columbus, stay in Mansfield, this and that, and, you know, God just took, took care of it and, um, and just <laughs> let us through it all. And um, so we, we were headed to uh, Dr. Exon's office, and at the time, my mom and dad were with us, and um, we were sitting in his office and um, talking about it, and he finally explains to us how aggressive it is and how bad it could be. And um, we found out that I was actually in stage three, and, you know, there's four stages. And so it was, it was pretty bad. Um, it was all through my lymph nodes, all through my body. And the only part that um, it hadn't attacked was my uh, bone marrow, which was very fortunate that it didn't. Um, but still, I was in stage three in pretty bad shape. Um, so uh, he was ready to start chemo as soon as we could and uh, get everything started. Um, so all this, again, was new to us. We didn't have anybody close to us that had gone through cancer, so we didn't know, know anything really about it. And I didn't, I didn't even know what chemo was. You know, I didn't know what happened when you went to get chemo. And, um, but we, we went up to Cancer Care at Med Central because um, that's where Dr. Exon had us go and where I would get my chemo. And, you know, we walk in the door there, and it's pretty scary, not sure what's going on, and greeted by these nurses that, you know, Along the journey, just became like a second mom to us. Um, took care of us, and we just had we had great nurses, great doctors, and 
just surrounded by great people. Um, you know, just family and friends were always there, and uh, most importantly, you know, my wife was beside me the whole time, and uh, we were blessed that she was able to stay in the hospital, and I don't, I don't ever remember her leaving my side, and um, I can honestly say I don't know if I would actually be up here sitting here um, if it wasn't, wasn't for that. Um, but just, just different ways God blessed us, and, um, you know, and, and the nurses just didn't, you know, I was a patient, but, you know, they didn't just take care of me. They, they always made sure Ashley was comfortable, and, um, again, they were, they were like a second mom to us. Um, so, you know, went in for chemo and, you know, sat in a room with, you know, other people and sit in a chair and get an IV hooked up to you and just get poison pumped into you, really, just to kill all the chemo, or the cancer. And um, so I went through uh, three different cycles, A, B, and C, and um, so I went through A, B, and C, and then A, B, C, and then C again. And... Um, before I started the chemo, I had a knot on the one side that was about the size of a golf ball on my neck, and the other side was even bigger. And um, the, the first cycle, um, two weeks out of that first month, um, I had chemo for three days, and then I had a whole week off, and then I went back on Wednesday and had it for three days. Well, after the first three days, you know, I went through it, and um, the next week it started to kick in, started feeling sick. And then by the time I went in the next time, uh, my doctor came in and checked, and um, the one that was bigger than a golf ball had shrunk down to the size of a dime. And you know, this, this doctor that's prescribing all the medicine and everything said, you know, th this doesn't happen. Um, he goes, it, it had to be a miracle from God. And, you know, the, the doctor could easily say, you know, well, yeah, you know, I did this or did that. But no, he, he gave the glory to God and said, you know, this, is, this just doesn't happen. So God just showed up so many, so many times. And um, when I was finally done with cycle A then, uh, it was right before Thanksgiving, I went in for a CAT scan and um, got the results back. And it was actually, it was all gone except for a spot on my sternum. Um, and at that time, they weren't even sure if it was still cancer, if it was just uh, scar tissue. Um, so, I mean, God showed up right from the beginning. Um, so from there, you know, we thought, well, cancer's about gone, you know, easy sailing now, chemo's going to be easier, and, well, we didn't know that's not how it works. So um, we went in for our um, second cycle, cycle B, and it was actually a very, very aggressive chemo. Um, and I would go in for um, four days, just one week out of the whole month for the cycle, and we'd be there for, I don't know, eight hours a day. And... Um, you just sit there and, you know, uh, get chemo. And um, that definitely hit me a little bit harder. Uh, we ended up in the hospital. Um, it, was, it was scary. Never been in the hospital. All my life I'd been healthy and never really had to deal with anything like that. But, you know, uh, God blessed us with great nurses. And, again, blessed me with a wonderful wife to be by my side the whole time. And, uh, you know, he, he was just with us and everything. Um, so, finally got out of the hospital after being in there for about a week. And, um, you know, we got to spend, you know, Christmas and everything at home and spend time with the family and everything. And things were going good. And uh, then it was time to go back in for cycle C, which um, it was actually like a 36-hour um, chemo. And... Um, Things went pretty good. Uh, it was kind of tough because we had to stay in the hospital, which isn't fun. But, you know, uh, I think I actually made it the funnest it could be. So, <laughs> but, um, so everything went well with that. And I didn't really get too sick with that chemo. But then I was back to, um, went back through cycle A again. Um, everything was going pretty good still. You know, it hit me a little bit harder than the first time I went through it. And then it was back to cycle B. And um, at that point, you know, after having the kind of the scare the first time with um, ending up in the hospital, it was kind of scary. And um, so I went in for it, um, got that finished up. We were at home, and you know, shortly after that, um, at night I, I got real sick. And um, you know, it was our bathroom was only a couple couple feet away from our our bedroom, but Ashley would have to help me up and get me to the bathroom every time in the middle of the night. And you know, we were probably a little too stubborn than what we should have been. We should have been in the hospital that night. And um, 
Yeah, it was dead of winter, so it was cold out, and we lived in an apartment that was 17 steps up high, and, um, you know, we probably should have called somebody to help us, but, you know, Ashley's not very big, but she got me down the steps into the car, and I think that was a miracle on the day it was, so. Um, but we got up to the hospital, and, you know, Ashley already knew I, I wasn't doing good, and when you're going through chemo and cancer care, they would always let you do valet parking, and I always told Ashley, you know, don't worry about it. We can walk, you know, I'm fine. Well, that day I told her, valet park and get me a wheelchair because I can't, I can't do it. And um, we got up to cancer care and showing up in a wheelchair, they knew that I wasn't doing very good. And um, so they checked everything out and um, started pumping me with fluids and everything. And they thought I was just uh, dehydrated at the time. And it was weird because on Wednesdays, um, it was really their busiest day, and um, I was the only patient in there that day. It was kind of crazy. But um, so they were pumping me with fluids, and, you know, we were sitting there, and um, I started shivering, like I had a fever or weren't sure what it was. So they gave me some Tylenol, and nothing was helping, and it got worse and got worse. And um, I actually went into septic shock, um, and they had to call Code Blue and just all of a sudden nurses and doctors were flying in and I'm sitting in the chair and people are surrounding me hooking stuff up to me and you know, Ashley's you know squat down right beside me praying and, and just bawling at the time and you know, I'm, I'm looking over at these machines and you know I looking at the numbers thinking well the machines must be broke because that can't that can't be right you know but um, they were they were right and um, um, just got through that and finally, when they got everything under control, I got down to the ICU. And um, I'll let Ashley share that story with you. Um, once, once he was down in the ICU, um, they had taken some blood cultures. And in the middle of the night, they got the first results back from that. And um, Dr. Exton actually came back in in the middle of the night. And um, he told us what that they had found out what kind of infection it was that sent him into shock. And um, he was in there prescribing all different kinds of prescriptions. And um, uh, the first thing that he had to do was um, get Kyle some healthy blood. So they were um, doing blood transfusions and hanging the, the blood. And um, Dr. Exton said, that's not fast enough. So they put the sleeve on it that worked like a blood pressure cuff to help squeeze the blood in faster. And um, Dr. Exton said, that's still not fast enough. So he actually yanked off the sleeve and he was squeezing this blood in as fast as he could and um, just to try to get Kyle some healthy blood because his was so, so infected. Um, so after... After all that got calmed down and everything, I asked Dr. Exton, I said, is he going to be okay? <laughs> and Dr. Exton said, had we not caught it, he would not have lived. And if he had not been at the hospital when he went into shock, he would not be alive. And if his heart would not have been strong from the beginning, he wouldn't have been alive. Um, so we knew it was pretty serious. Um, I don't, I don't know if she shared that with me at that time, because I remember laying in the hospital bed asking Dr. X, and, well, is it serious? Like, because I, like, you know, I was sick, but it wasn't anything unnormal, and, uh, he's like, yeah, it's pretty serious. So, um, so when you're in the ICU, you know, they, they don't like to have somebody stay with you because they could get in the way or this or that. Well, I actually didn't like that because she stayed every night with me. Um, and she fought, and she got to stay the night. Um, so I'm laying there, and, um, you know, when you're in the hospital, you have a little remote, you know, call for the nurse. And, well, we couldn't find ours. So I actually was like, well, I'll just push this big red button on the wall, because we'll, that'll get the nurses. <laughs> so we got, like, four nurses flying in, like, what's going on? And she's like, well, I just need some water or something. So <laughs> like... Well, don't push that button then. So, <laughs> so um, it was, we'd, even through all the hard times, we still have fun together and a lot of things to laugh about because I, I know we laughed that night. So, <laughs> um, 
But, um, you know, as sick as I was, you know, they thought I'd definitely be nice to you longer than I was. But um, that next morning I was in step down. And I didn't even stay a whole day in step down. I was back up to um, the fourth floor where um, I would go when I'd get sick normally. And um, so we were, we were actually back into more of a comfort zone. We knew the nurses. And, um, you know, we were in a lot better stage at that point. And um, so we were in the hospital, and we were in the hospital for quite a while that time. Um, but um, got out of the hospital and got things back to normal, started feeling better again, went through um, cycle C, and then got back home, things went good, and went through cycle C again. Um, and, you know, we were finally done with all the chemo. We thought, you know, we're done, finally. Um, so we go in, and, um, you know, by this time, all the cancer's gone, and um, so things are going really good. And we go in and sit down with Dr. Exton, and he said, you know, things are going good. He goes, but I want to do some precautionary things. So now, um, thinking that we're all already done, I have two more weeks of radiation um, to my head just for precautionary. And then um, I had to go in and um, get a port put in my head so they can put chemo um, down through my spinal fluid. And so a little nervous about that and went in and met with the doctor to get that put in because they were going to have to you know, drill a hole through my head. And it's a little scary. And you know, the doctor made me feel a lot better because I went in and he said he only had one guy die on the table on him. So <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if that's supposed to make me feel better or not. But, but um, we got through that and uh, finished up the chemo and um, everything went real good. And... Um, after that was finished up, I was on pills for, you know, chemo pills for two years and didn't have, you know, much of an effect on me. Um, but, you know, God, God showed up in so many ways through that, just, um, you know, so many prayers. And um, it was weird because um, there were so many people praying, and at the beginning I didn't understand, like, you know, why, you know, people that didn't even really know God or even believe in God was praying. And I asked my dad, I said, you know, wh why doesn't God just heal me so these people can just see God's work? And he said, you know, sometimes you've got to ride through the storm. And um, he said, you know, if, if you were healed now, do you think these same people would be praying for you two months from now and still be praying? And, and uh, I said, no, no. So, you know, they, it kept these people close to God and praying and and um, you know, I don't know if that touched anybody through that or not, but um, it made it a little bit easier to have to go through the whole thing. But, um, it, and again, God just showed up in so many ways, um, just blessing us and, you know, from family and friends and um, great doctors and nurses and things going smooth. And, um, you know, he, he also blessed us financially, um, you know, with the story at the beginning, tell you how poor we were. Um, from day one when I found out, my first concern was, you know, I got a wife now. How are we going to pay the bills? You know, I'm not going to be able to work all the time. And um, God took care of us. I mean, right off the bat, um, people were sending money. Um, people we didn't know would send us money, gift cards. And, and just, it was just incredible, um, the blessings that we had. And um, it was weird because shortly before that, I had talked to my dad again about, um, you know, We've been tithing, and you know, I'm not getting a raise at work, you know. Like, is God going to show up with this, you know? And he said, you yeah, know, it doesn't always work out that way, you know. You don't always get blessed in one way or the other. And, and um, you know, for God to show up and bless us tremendously financially was just, it was amazing to see him work. And, you know, we already had enough things to worry about, so not to worry about bills or anything. Um, it, was, it was a tremendous blessing. But he, he just, uh, he took care of us in so many ways, and, and um, I remember that first time we met with Dr. Exton, and um, I know, I don't know if Ashley asked or Dr. Exton brought it up, and wanted to know if, you know, are we going to be able to have kids after he goes through all this? And he said, you know, there's, there's probably not a very good chance of it. And, um, you know, I knew I was pretty broken by that, and I know Ashley started bawling, I think, right there in the office. Uh, but um, now we have two beautiful, healthy little girls, and um, the second one starts sleeping, we might have more, so I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 But, uh, you know, 
we're healthy and things are going great. And, uh, you know, and it's not really a story about us, but God came into our lives and I don't think we really did anything. God just took care of it all. And, uh, you know, we're happy, healthy, got a great family, and that's where we're at now. So, praise God. Let's look at those pictures again. Anyone else remember being 19 and feeling invincible? You know, young and in love, and here we have this shot of Kyle and Ashley, 19, young, in love, invincible, just got married. Probably had some people saying that's dumb, but they knew better, right? So they're doing it anyway. And then within three months, stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it doesn't look good. And now, here recently, uh, and how they ended their story, what a cool thing to think you know, all of those chemicals and all that poison to kill the cancer, and they can have a family just like that. Isn't that cool? Can we give one more hand to Kyle and Ashley? I want to drop in as we wrap up today to a few verses where we see it seems like things are closing in on Jesus. And it appears like he may be coming to the end. And in Luke chapter 22, we see these words. It says this, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, they, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Remember that, okay? Pray that you will not fall into temptation, Jesus' disciples say. And then he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed. Now we're going to stay here for just a second. What is it that God, wrapped in human flesh, prays when, when things close in, when it seems like from a worldly perspective, things may not work out very well? Some flowery prayer, right? Some prayer that's, that's full of faith and has unending peace, right? Well, let's see what he says. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. God asks, do I have to do this? Is there any other way? God says, I don't want to do it even, if we can figure this out. And yet, he says, but not what I want. Father, what you want. And then what happens in response to that? An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, see, he gets strength for what he's going through, but he's still in anguish. Being in anguish, he prays more earnestly. There's this resolve we see here. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. In just these few verses, we see the term prayer or pray used five times. Pray, 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 pray. When we pray, do we do things or do we trust? We trust, don't we? I mean, if, if we're going to pray, that's, that's saying, God, we trust you. Instead of trusting in our own ability to get it done, it's not about doing, it's about trusting. And here's the last couple sentences. When Jesus rose from prayer and went back to his disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray. And here we see it again. So that you don't fall into temptation. The disciples weren't lazy. I mean, the text tells us that they were exhausted from sorrow. They were tired from fear. When we have a lot going on in our lives, don't we sort of say the same thing? I, 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 need, I need some sleep. We need our, our strength. We need to sleep on it, to think about it, to figure it out. And to that, Jesus says, no, you need to pray. 
The prayer is the important thing. So what temptation here that is mentioned at the start of these short verses and at the end of these short verses that Jesus seems to be so worried that his disciples are going to fall into, what is this temptation? This temptation that the antidote to seems to be prayer. The temptation very simply is this. That they would trust themselves instead of trusting in Jesus. It's a temptation we all face, right? Do I trust in me and what I can control and what I can do? Or do I trust in Jesus? And so when we trust, there's a couple things that, that we can do. I'm going to unveil a new term for you guys today, all right? This is a, a brand new one. Um, when you trust, sometimes you pull a Louie. Huh? This is Louie right here. I actually asked him if I could share this with you. Not too many weeks ago, we thought Louie wasn't going to be here with us much longer. Actually, a number of us were in his hospital room on a Saturday night. And, and we didn't know. And he's here. And I still remember that next day, man, because we had a whole bunch of people praying for you. We prayed for you in the first gathering. And in, in the second one, some family members showed up and said, he's sitting up in a chair. It was awesome. And so it was just in the last week or so where, where one of the leaders here said to me, you know, someone pulled a Louie. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, they weren't doing well. And then all of a sudden they're doing great. And then this leader actually said in a kind of an emotional way, you know, when I heard what was going on with Louie, I prayed, but I didn't think things were going to happen. I mean, after all, the doctors had said it didn't look good. But do we put our trust and our hope in doctors? No. We put them in God. And the same person said, you know what? What happened to Louis has given them more faith, not just to pray, kind of knowing, well, that's going to happen, but to pray, believing that God can do whatever God wants to do and bring people back from the verge of, it seems like, life being over and have new life. Amen? But sometimes we don't get to pull a Louis. Sometimes... You pull a Jesus. And Jesus died. And some of you are saying, yeah, yeah, but he rose again to life. Right. That's what we get to do too. If we know Jesus, if we trust Jesus, that's what life, the Bible says, can be for us as well. On Friday a great Christian writer and author passed away named Brennan Manning. He actually would have turned 79 later this month. And his obituary starts with some of his own words, and they say this, Suffering, failure, loneliness, sorrow, discouragement, and death will be part of your journey. If you've lived any time at all, you know this is true. But the kingdom of God will conquer all these horrors. No evil can resist grace forever. This is what we believe. If we stop trying to figure things out and control things and we just trust in God, this can be part of our experience. And I believe what you heard today from Kyle and Ashley could have been the same regardless of what their story looked like. Ashley could have been sitting here with one stool by herself because her husband's life was taken from cancer. And yet, if she would choose to trust, she could look at all of us and say, you know what, I went through the most horrible thing ever, but I trusted in God and he was there with me. And he got me through. And so I have no idea all the things that all of you are facing today. I have no idea all of the circumstances of all of your lives, but I do know this. We all have a decision to make. Do we trust in God or do we try to figure it out ourselves? And I know the better path. Trusting in God, humbling ourselves, giving our lives to him is always the way to go. And so, Father, today, we want to thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for an incredible story that Kyle and Ashley told us today of of especially at such a young age, being forced and pushed 
to a place of needing to trust in ways greater than maybe they ever thought they would or maybe even that most of us need to in most of our lives. And yet, whether it was their physical health or their financial health or for their family, God, they continue to trust you and you continue to meet them at their place of greatest need. And so, God, I just ask today for us, no matter where we are, may their story be more than just their story, but God, may it be our story too. And regardless of what's happening, God, regardless of whatever our needs may be today, help us to forget about trying to control everything and help us simply to trust you and Jesus to allow you to be Lord and Savior of our lives. We humble ourselves now in Jesus' name. Amen.